Isabella, I'm so proud of you. This is my niece, and she asked me to baptize her, and so this is a very, very special day. I feel very honored. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, Isabella, do you love Jesus? I love Jesus. That's right. Have you, have you decided to follow him? Yeah, I'm going to follow him. That's right. And you believe that he died on a cross, and three days later he rose, and he did that for you. Yeah. That's right. He did it. You're right. So what you're doing today is you're telling all these people yeah. that you're a Christian and that you love Jesus. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, my friend. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to celebrate, and Pastor Mason and I, we're going to baptize you, okay? So he's going to come right here with us. So because you have said these things and you've professed with your mouth, you've made this proclamation that you're a follower of Jesus, we're going to yeah. baptize you in the name of the Father yeah. and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So can you bend your knees a little bit? Yes. Okay, you ready? Here we go. One, One two, two, three. three. <laughs> Yay, good job, Judy. Good job, Isabella. Good job, Isabella. So what you guys can't tell from where you're at is this. This feels a lot more like getting baptized in a river or something today, not like a warmed up baptism pool. So we have a team who did their best and warmed it up a bit, but it's a little bit chilly. Haley, big day. I've been really excited for your baptism. Um, and I know we just, I think we just met for the first time this morning. I'm not sure we've met before, but I want you guys to know there's something really unique about this baptism. And that's that Haley's been around here a bit, but she's been, she has been deeply ingrained in the Brooklyn family for a while now, but it's been in the context of your house church, right? Your house church mates in Edgewood. Edgewood. She's in the Edgewood house church, like ingrained in that community, part of that community. And it's in that context um, just lately that you've been like walking with those people and have made the decision to be baptized. Mm -hmm. That's really exciting. That's, that's, this might be the first baptism in Brooklyn's history that's not been like, I've been attending for so long and now I'm getting baptized, but like, hey, I've been in house church for so long and now I'm getting baptized. What a beautiful thing. So we're gonna celebrate that today. Amazing. We're, we're here to celebrate what Haley's doing and ultimately we're here to celebrate the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Haley, I'll have you turn your back under the wall here. Okay, Haley, just a, a few questions for you. Um, are you making the decision today have you made the decision? Are you publicly declaring today that you've made the decision to follow Jesus with all that you are? Yes. Are you trusting that Jesus didn't just start the process, but he meant it when he said on the cross that it's finished and that he, he has accomplished all that was necessary to be accomplished for you to have a life to the full today and life to the full forever? Yes. And are you, are you here today to publicly declare in front of this church family that you are giving your life to following Jesus? Yes. That's awesome. Okay, well, you passed the test. So it's, uh, I'll have you plug your nose. Okay, because of your declaration of faith, it's my joy and my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I think I'm hearing some whoops from that house church sitting right up here together. I think some of you are up here. <clears throat> yes, it's a little chilly, huh? Can you guys all say hi to Esri? Esri. Esri and her family, this is her dad, Nate. You probably recognize them. They've been around for some time. And um, Esri, it's, it's the joy of me, along with your dad, to baptize you today. How cool is that, that your dad gets to be in the tank, too, and we get to do that together. So, um, okay, I'm going to have you turn around here, Esri, with your back kind of this way. Nate, why don't you go over on this side? We can make sure that you're more on camera and get photos. <laughs> that's, that's what's important. Um, okay, Esri, just a few questions for you. Are you getting baptized today to tell your church family that you love Jesus? Yes. And are you, through your baptism today, saying, I want to follow Jesus with my life? And are you 
believing in Jesus to give you life, that light, like joyful life that starts today, but also life forever with him in heaven. Yes. Yes. That's awesome. Okay, well, I'm going to have you plug your nose like this, okay? Okay, so Esri, it's because of your declaration of faith that your dad and I have the honor today to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. family, can you say hello to Mia Hamilton? <laughs> Many of you know Mia and her sisters. Her dad, Steve, leads us in worship. Her mom, Kim, is up here. Many of you know Kim as well. Um, what a, this is so exciting, Mia. Me and your dad get to baptize you today. It's such an exciting moment that you're going to remember for the rest of your life. Um, why don't you stand kind of with your back towards your dad here? And, yeah, that's perfect, right there. And me and your dad, why, actually, why don't you take a couple steps up so we don't bonk you on the wall on the way down, okay? <laughs> okay, Mia, I'm just going to ask you uh, a couple questions, okay, about baptism. Uh, Mia, are you today getting baptized in front of your church to tell everybody that you are trusting in Jesus for life today and life forever with him? Yes. Yes, and are you believing that Jesus, when he died on the cross and then when he rose again, that he accomplished all that needed to be accomplished on your behalf? Yes. Yes. And do you believe that Jesus loves you? Yes. You do. <laughs> and do you want to follow Jesus forever? Yes. You do. Yeah, come on, girl. Those are good answers. Okay, well, Mia, I'm going to have you step right over here closer to me, okay? And why don't you plug your nose with one hand? Okay. Awesome. Okay, Mia, because of your confession of faith, it's the joy and honor of your dad and I to baptize you today in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Come on, everybody. How exciting is that? Oh, it doesn't get old. That's my favorite Sundays ever when people go public in their faith through baptism. Thank you, Ryan. If you need to uh, go public in your faith through water baptism, you have been following Jesus for a day or 10 years, but you've not yet followed him in baptism. In terms of obedience, I encourage you to do that. You can jump on our website and take that step. Um, I got to tell you, I am part of the house church that uh, a couple of those individuals are a part of. And there's nothing more powerful to watch somebody's story with Jesus take shape right in front of you. Have a front row view. And God, I'm telling you what, God is moving. God is moving in his church. He's moving in this community. He's moving despite us. Amen? Amen. And he, he loves to use us. Hey, I'm Scott, and uh, I get to uh, teach today. I'm a lead pastor here at Brook Lake. If you're relatively new or around here or new-ish, well, welcome. We're glad you're here. Um, and in fact, we're going to just ask you to stand and tell your story in a second. No, we just don't. We won't do that. We don't do that. We don't do that. But we do want to invite you to text Brook Lake, the word Brook Lake, to 94,000. Text Brook Lake to 94000, and it's our way of uh, just beginning a conversation with you. You'll get an auto reply back with a link, and you can kind of go at your own pace. But if you have questions about who we are, where we're going, all that stuff, you can obviously go to the website, a lot of content on the website. Um, and we also just want to invite you to text that word Brook Lake to 94000. Hey, we're in um, week or part 10. It's been several weeks because we took a break for 21 days of prayer and fasting. It's been Easter. But we're in part 10 of our study through the book of Daniel. We've got today, 
uh, next Sunday and the Sunday after that. So we've got three more parts, including today. Um, I won't ask if you're enjoying it because I don't want to know if you're not. So, um, uh, but I tell you what, this has been a, a, good, a good journey for us. And today we come to this um, another epic uh, instance in the book of Daniel that maybe some of you will be familiar with. If you've been unfamiliar, you're just joining us uh, for this study. You're just joining us today, whether you're in person or you're online. There's been a few epic stories that we've dealt with, right? We have uh, Daniel in the lion's den. Uh, we have the, the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. Um, today we have an instance that maybe you've heard of, which we'll get to in a moment. But for the vast majority, Daniel is, a, is, a, is about um, a, a boys that, a Hebrew boys that have been exiled uh, to Babylon. And they retained their trust in Jesus despite being exiles in a foreign land. And that is, the, that is where we find ourselves um, in navigating this, this life. We are called to remain uh, connected and, and, and faithful to Jesus despite being um, in the world that does not serve Jesus as we do. And so there's been a lot to learn. And today we come to this, uh, this showdown between some spiritual forces. And so I've titled today, What's Up with Spiritual Warfare?, What's up with spiritual warfare? Some of you are like going, oh, this is going to be good. Can't wait for this. And then others are like, oh, man, how can we slip out? How can we slip out? Have you ever been on a walk with somebody and uh, you're, you're doing relatively well, you know, and then you come to this hill and you're walking up this hill with this individual, and you get to kind of midway through the hill, and you realize that you're unable to carry on the conversation with this person because you can't breathe. How many of you have tried to just pretend your way through? Like, you're trying to breathe as quiet as possible, and you're just hoping that there's a break in the conversation so you can get your breath. How many of you have been like me and found yourself in that situation? Or how many of you have been walking down the grocery aisle and uh, you, you find what you need, what you're looking for, but there's somebody else right in front of you, right? Like they're standing in front of you. They're not reaching for what it is you need, and they're so close to what it is that you need that you're kind of like, ah, it's just awkward, and they look at you, and you're like, you pretend to look at something else that you have no interest in, but just, just kind of weird, you know, you know I don't, why don't we just say, like, excuse me, can I just grab what I need? You're right in front, like, you're not being considerate, so can you step aside, you know? <laughs> or how many of you have uh, opened up your birthday card, and you're pretending not to see the check that's in there? As you read the card, and the whole time you're like trying to find out what's the amount on the check. Is that just me, or is there anybody else? Just me, okay. I, th I think a lot of Christians, a lot of followers of Jesus, that's kind of how we are as it relates to uh, a spiritual battle and, and the reality of a spiritual realm. And, and a lot of us don't know what to do with the Scripture, and it's actually throughout Scripture, from the first pages of Scripture where we see the enemy come and tempt Adam and Eve through the very end of Scripture where there is this epic showdown between forces of good and evil or God and Satan. And I think a lot of churches, and I've been guilty of this, and a lot of pastors, and I've been guilty of this, we don't teach on this subject that is throughout Scripture. In fact, it's such a real reality that the writers of these letters that were sent to these early churches, Paul and Peter, they addressed in a lot of instances, almost in every letter, something to do with this reality there is something going on in the unseen world. Spiritual forces, powers and principalities that are at work out there that we can't see, but many of us perceive. And most of us, I would say all of us, experience a spiritual weight and heaviness that is as a result of a war that's going on out there somewhere. 
Spiritual warfare is in that category for Christians where we're just kind of like looking at something else, hoping it's not really true, but yet our world co- collides with the unseen world over and over and over and over. Abraham Kuyper says this, If once the curtain were pulled back and the spiritual world behind it came to view, it would expose to our spiritual vision a struggle so intense, so convulsive, sweeping everything within its range, that the fiercest battle ever fought on earth would seem, by comparison, a mere game. Not here, but up there. That is where the real conflict is waged. Our earthly struggle drones in its backlash. I approach today, not because I chose to talk about this, but because it's what appears in Daniel chapter 10. And you can't declare you're going to do a study through a book and then skip over a chapter. Everybody would be like, what did you not want to deal with? Right? Right? That's called a topical series. And that's why I do a lot of them, because I just don't want to have to deal with everything. Just joking, kind of. (laughs) But I want us to see, I want us to see today a holistic approach. I, I believe a very balanced approach as it relates to the subject of spiritual warfare. Now, if you're brand new with us today, if you're newer around here, you've been coming two or three weeks, and your question is, are we a church? Is this a pastor that hyper-focuses on this subject all the time? I want to invite you, after the gathering, to just go to four or five people that look like they kind of know their way around and ask them that question. Because I feel like we owe it to you. Because trust has not been established yet. You don't trust me. You're trying to figure that out. You don't trust us because you're trying to figure us out. And I just simply want to invite you to ask people that look like they know where they're going, um, it, hey, is this something that we always talk about around here? Because we're kind of looking to plug in with a church community in this area. This is where we feel like God is leading us. And I just all to say, I just want you to know, I try to approach this from a balanced standpoint. I think we've covered that. Have we covered that? Have we covered that? 1 John 4, 2 through 4 says this, You are from God, little children, and you have conquered them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Can we read, starting with because, right after that comma, can we read that out loud together? Ready? One, two, three. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. When it comes to discussions about spiritual warfare or our enemy, Satan, the devil, whatever title you want to give to him, though the reality of him is there, true, I want you to see and I want you to understand that we have a God It is not his equal. God is not the equal. God is not the opposite of our enemy. We have a creator God. He is one God in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we don't have time to deal with the the history behind the enemy, but there was this angelic community where their job was to give worship and praise to God for all eternity. And the Bible indicates that their pride rose up within the ranks led by one angel. Because he wanted worship for himself, and because he pride rose up, he was banished from the presence of God, and Satan was born. The reason I want you to know that is because it's not God on one bookshelf and Satan on the other. It's God, Lord over all, all creation, all powerful, and for whatever reason which we will have to reserve, uh, our, our, be patient until we get to, to heaven. Whatever reason God allowed this angelic being to exist for the purposes of temptation and other things that I know a lot of us struggle with. 
a lot of us struggle with the reality of why is there good, why is there evil, and if God is so good, then all of those things, and that's a, that's a topic for another time. The point I want you to make today is I want your heart to be rested assured that we have a God that is altogether powerful and is not equal to the enemy in terms of power, authority. Amen? If that's all we covered, that would be enough today. But we have Daniel 10. Are you ready? Some of you are like, finally, just get going. Uh, number, the first point I want to make, and then we're going to read some, some verses out of Daniel 10 um, to substantiate these, these points. We're going to make five of them today. Number one is, you are loved by God and he is always with you. Number one, you are loved by God and he is always with you. I want you to look at verses 10 through the first part of 12. It says this, Suddenly a hand touched me and set me shaking on my hands and knees. He said to me, Daniel, you are a man treasured by God. Let's just pause right there. Some of you, you need to hear that today. I want you to replace your name with the word Daniel. And that's how I want you to read this today. Scott, you are a man treasured by God. Josh, you are a man treasured by God. Carol, you are a woman treasured by God. I want every one of you to hear this today. God sees you, God knows you, God understands everything you're walking through. Whether that's in the natural, I'm struggling with this or with that, or whether or not there is a spiritual war going on, you are not unloved, and you're not being punished. He goes on to say, understand the words that I am saying to you. Stand on your feet. Oh. Man, we could talk a long time about that. Stand on your feet. Because what do you do when you get tired and full of fear and overwhelmed? I don't know about you, but it affects my posture. It affects how I feel. It literally lives in my body. Right? Stand on your feet, for I have now been sent to you. After he said this, I stood trembling. Well, I guess so, right? Whenever some angelic being comes to you and, and just has a conversation with you, you should not feel light about that. Like it should not be, hey, pass the mustard. It should be like, hey, oh my goodness, like what is happening right now, right? You should stand trembling, but stand. Don't be afraid, Daniel, he said to me. No, we don't have to talk too much about this because I think I've mentioned it many times, but in case you forget, this, this command, don't be afraid, right here, that, that is the most commanded phrase in th throughout Scripture. Fear not, don't be afraid, throughout. And it's always followed by what? For I am with you. I want you to know, the first thing I want you to know is you are loved by God and he is always with you. You are loved by God, and he is always with you. But you don't understand what's going on in my life. I'm experiencing the consequences of, of, of choices that I have made in my past. Yep, we get it. I get it. That doesn't change the fact that you are loved by God, and he is always with you. Right? There's nothing that you could have done or will do that will cause God to abandon you. So many people think they're on their own, they're by themselves, and they, and they will walk through the doors of these, this building, and, and they think, well, here's where I've been, and because of where I've been, I'm, gonna, I'm preparing for lightning to strike as I walk in. Right? I won't ask for a show of hands, of how many of you thought that the first time you stepped into a church building? Right? But if that is true, that God punishes us with a bolt of lightning when we step onto some physical space that we call the church campus, every one of us would have scars on our back from a strike of lightning. 
you are loved by God, and he is always with you. Number two, your humility before God and others influences your prayers being answered. Your humility before God and others influences your prayers being answered. The second part of verse 12 says this, For from the first day that you purposed to understand and to humble yourself before God, your prayers were heard. I have come because of your prayers. So, what this messenger is telling Daniel is this. There was a time, Daniel, when you were having a prayer meeting by yourself, or we don't know the context, but you prayed some prayers, right? The moment you prayed those prayers, you were heard. You were heard. Okay, Daniel, you, you were heard. I, I'll, let's, let's just get that straight. Because the answer didn't arrive, I want you to know, Daniel, that you were heard. How many of you find good news in that? Like, we're always looking at the outcome, right? Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, is, is, is God ha- has God answered my prayers? We'll talk about that in a moment. But one thing we need to be firmly committed to understanding is, is that God listens. God hears. God hears prayers like, Help. God hears prayers like, I don't know what to do. God hears prayers like, are you there? God hears prayers like, I'm struggling with believing. Are you real? God hears prayers like, God, if you're so good then why have I experienced this? God hears prayers like, if you really directed my path, then how come this relationship, this marriage, this parent-child relationship, how come it's suffering? God hears prayers That are hard to pray. God specializes in hearing prayers that if He were literally right in front of us, our knees would be knocking as we uttered those words. God hears those prayers. God hears the prayers in the middle of the night when your heart is being ripped out for some reason. And you're praying a prayer and you're not even sure if God's going to answer it. And you begin to believe that he's not even listening. Friends, if all you need to hear this moment, please hear this. God is not absent from you. There's nothing you have done to cause God to leave you. His love, Romans tells us, Paul tells us, his love knows no separation from us. He will chase us. He goes after us. He pursues you. He is in love with you. He hears you. He listens to you. Your prayers are influenced by our humility. I'm not going to take you on a tour of some some scriptures. We'll leave that maybe for another time. But, for example, Paul or Peter would tell the audience that he's writing to that um, husbands, hey, if you're not treating your wives right, then your prayers will go unanswered. Ouch. Right? So this idea that we have to understand that our posture before God has nothing to do with God hearing us, but our posture before God has everything to do with God providing for us what it is that we're needing from him. God's purposes, 
and your prayers have an enemy. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9 says this, Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for someone he can devour. Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that he, the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. Number three, God's purposes and your prayers have an enemy. Back to Daniel chapter 10, verses 13 through 14, it says this, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me. Now, again, let me, let me try to bring this into a flow. Right? We have this messenger standing before Daniel saying, Hey, you're treasured by God. Uh, God has sent me. And from the first time you prayed this prayer, I have been dispatched to provide the answer to you. Now we pick up in verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for 21 days... Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me after I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to help you understand what will happen to your people in the last days, for the vision refers to those days. Now, listen, there's a whole lot that Daniel, the writer here, there's a whole lot that he leaves out of this story. Like, who is this person? And my goodness, Michael, like... Michael, Michael, like the angel Michael, he was dispatched. Like that must have been like a, a big deal. Like the heavy hitters was dispatched, right? And I want you to know, just simply, just one thing we can take away from this is that we have an enemy that opposes the purposes of God in our lives. We have an enemy that opposes the kingdom of God's establishment in our lives. That's why when we face uh, trials and hardships, he seems to attack the very things that, are, that stand to illuminate the presence of God in this world. He attacks our marriages. He attacks our, our relationship with our children. He attacks the way that we steward and manage our finances. Right? The very things that the enemy wants to take out in our lives are the things that will in, in reflect his goodness and provision to the world around us. And we need to understand that God's purposes and our prayers have an enemy. Number four, you are loved and empowered, therefore don't be afraid. We don't have much in there about this encounter and why there was a delay other than there was angelic opposition, demonic opposition, right? And these angels were dispatched to fight in the heavenlies. We don't have much more detail about that, but then he just skips to verse 15. He says this, while he was saying these words to me, I turned my face toward the ground and was speechless. <laughs> like many of us are right now, we're like, what is going on? Suddenly, one with human likeness touched my lips. Would you turn to somebody and just say human likeness? This is not to be lost on us. This is the second time this kind of reference shows up in Daniel. Does anybody remember the first time? How about the fourth person appearing in the fiery furnace in human form like a son of, yeah. It's verse 16. Suddenly one with human likeness touched my lips. I opened my mouth and said to the one standing in front of me, my Lord, because of the vision, anguish overwhelms me and I am powerless. How can someone like me, your servant, speak with someone like you, my Lord? Now I have no strength and there is no breath in me. Let's just pause right there. We'll come back to verse 18 in a minute. We'll pick this up. I think a lot of us have experienced the mental, emotional, and physical responses to poor choices that we have made, to a calendar that's way too busy, to living a life of comparison that God doesn't invite us into, there are a lot of reasons that many of us, some of us come out of the womb with hormones that are not quite balanced. Others of us experience trauma in life, 
Still others, there are women that experience a hormonal shift when they give birth and they never can quite get back to that hormone uh, balance. Uh, what I'm trying to convey to us today is there are natural and normative experiences that we all experience that provide a level of anxiety and, and, and being overwhelmed in life. And it is right and wise to, ex to go seek help from a mental care professional and a medical doctor. Absolutely, 100%. I have, my wife has, I bet many of us in this room, we have and continue to do so. It is amazing, you would agree, the connection between the way that the modern world lives and the reality that many of us feel that we just can't uh, get above our anxiety and, be, and feelings of being overwhelmed. And some of that, a lot of that, is not originating in a spiritual battle that's going on. I want us to see that. Having said that, I think a lot of us won't even acknowledge the fact that there is a spiritual battle that's going on, and we are experiencing the effects of it, of, of it in our minds, emotions, relationships, and life. And so the way in which we approach this is from a holistic standpoint, which we'll get to in a second. But I want us to see, I want us to see that we are not powerless in this game. That we do not have to succumb to this victim mindset. Whether the, the arena that's causing this intense fear, anxiety, or feelings of being overwhelmed is a spiritual battle that's going on or is a mental illness that's unfortunately we're, we're encountering or some other thing that's happening that cause our, our anxiety, our emotions, our hormones to get all out of whack, there is no shame in us experiencing that. So if you're overwhelmed today, you're full of anxiety today. Here's what you need to know. And I don't mean to diminish what it is that you're experiencing. But actually, what you're experiencing is more normative today than ever in history. And one of the reasons it is, is because we are not rightly diagnosing what it is that's going on. I have made the um, mistake. I have made the mistake of dismissing what's happening in the spiritual realm and kind of putting that onto natural causes that I also have experienced. But I've, I've not wanted to um, identify or diagnose what it is that I'm experiencing as spiritual in nature. But here's what I know. Out of the seven nights of sleep that I get on a routine basis in a given week, can you guess which night is the worst sleep I get? Saturday. Now, some would say, well, that's just chalked up to like, you know, you, you kind of have a big day the next day few responsibilities, and maybe that's true. It starts for me about noon on Saturday. And I, and I, and I can feel it come on because I start to get irritable. And if I'm honest with you, some of that might be just natural causes, just got, you know, a big day of the coming next day, whatever, whatever. But here's what I've come to believe. Much of it is spiritual. You be, be careful the moment you declare God's purposes over your, over your marriage. Be careful the moment you say, you know what, honey? You know what we need to do? We're, we're going to start... 
We start loving Jesus, and, and here's how that's going to look, and how, here's how that's going to translate, and we're going we're gonna to start attending church, and we're going to get our kids, and we're going to start praying with one another. I guarantee you, you declare that, and all hell will break out in your home. And if it doesn't, maybe you're not doing it right. <laughs> Listen. The devil wouldn't be a very good devil if he just rolled over and let you serve Jesus and love Jesus with everything in you. Now, here's what we need to know about the devil, and I should have said this way at the beginning. He is just a mouse with a megaphone. Listen, he's just a mouse with a megaphone. I'm not trying to say he doesn't have, uh, uh, he doesn't scheme, he doesn't, but he, the only power that he really has that we see throughout Scripture is to deceive and get us to believe untruths, get us to believe something that's not true. And then we take over from there. Are you, is God really good? You know, I don't know. He wasn't really good there. And then we start believing that God, maybe he's not really good, or maybe he's not consistently good. You see, it's, it's subtle. Verse 18 says, Then the one with a human appearance touched me again. And some of you are going to experience that today. And strengthened me. He said, Don't be afraid. You who are treasured by God. There it is again. Peace to you. Be very strong. Be very strong. I wish you could hear the Lord whisper those words to you this morning. You're treasured. You're loved. Be very strong. Number five. This one won't be as long as the others, don't worry. Spiritual warfare should result in holistic renewal. Verse 19 says, As he spoke to me, I was strengthened. Everybody say the word strengthened. And said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Spiritual warfare is intended to affect every fiber of your being. Not just your spirituality, but it's, it, it, spiritual warfare attempts to derail your relationships, the way in which you approach your neighbor, the way in which you love others, the way that you approach enemy, the way in which you do finances, the way in which you do life. Spiritual warfare is to try to get you to distrust God. Ultimately, that's the goal. And once we believe the lie and distrust sets in, then we just take over from there. So when we, the result of spiritual warfare that is engaged on our part, that we invite other people to prayer and support and we win this battle of spiritual warfare, it is intended to result in holistic renewal. It's not just a peace in your heart where the enemy flees. No, it's a peace in relationships. It's a reconciliation of relationships. It's a holistic renewal that God wants to bring as a result of him winning the battle between the, in the spiritual realm. Amen? Now... I um I want you to leave today. We're gonna we're gonna stand in our, to our feet in just a second. We're gonna worship, we're gonna respond. And I'm gonna invite some of you to respond in a very specific way. But let me just say this generally over all of us today. I think I've emphasized this point, but I want you to leave um, with a an acute awareness, an understanding that the way you feel spiritually, emotionally, mentally is not an indication of the way God loves you. You need to know that. 
right? You are loved with this lavish, expansive, full measure of God's love, no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done. That blows my mind because I know so many of you. No, just kidding, because I know myself. (laughs) Way to run a moment, Scott. That was amazing. I want you to walk out today, everybody in this room, and those of you that are online or watching back, make sure you understand, make sure you get. um, You don't have that much power over God to determine whether or not he's going to love you less or more. As we stand to our feet all over this place, and let's do this now, we're going to spend a few moments, as we have been the last few weeks, worshiping, singing, letting God move amongst us, giving the Holy Spirit the room. Now listen, as I open up the front, and and some of you may respond, and then our prayer team will come. You can come for a variety of reasons. You can come because God's saying something in you, doing something in you, and you just feel like God's saying, hey, I want you to go forward. I want you to change your posture. I want you to change your location, given what I'm doing in, in your heart. And that's, that's why we're extending this time. That's why we're allowing this. And someone will come along behind you and lay a hand on your shoulder, an unassuming hand, and just pray a blessing over you. They won't ask you what's going on in your life. They won't ask you to articulate what's going on in your heart because you may not know exactly what's going on in your heart. They're just going to come alongside and lay a hand and say, Father, I just bless whatever it is that you're doing in their life. So anybody can come, but I specifically, I specifically this morning, and if you're at home, lean into this moment too. Don't lose this moment. Participate in a way that's appropriate for wherever you're at. I specifically want to invite people to step out in courage that have been praying for a very long time about something. And the answer seems to be delayed. I don't know what that is. You've been believing God for a long time. You've even started to believe maybe he doesn't hear me or maybe he doesn't care. Would you come forward and would you allow somebody to just step aside beside you, lay their hand on you, bless you, and pray on your behalf. Whatever it is you're believing God for, God, will you do that? Jesus, we love you today. Thank you for how you're moving in our lives, you're moving in our homes, you're moving in our church family. We pray, Father, for these next few moments as we worship, as we sing. We pray, Jesus, that you'd be honored, you'd be glorified. And I pray, Holy Spirit, have the room. Do what you want to do in people's lives. Touch people where they stand. Touch people when they respond. Do what you do best. Bring the love of the Father through Jesus Christ to our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's worship together. Come, respond.
family, I just want to share a scripture with you as we keep worshiping together. This is for those of you up front, those of you in your seats, those of you at home, those of you listening back. Psalm 109, it's a psalm about worship, and it, and it closes with these words. It says, I will fervently thank the Lord with my mouth. That's thanksgiving, and in context in the psalm, it's singing. It's actually singing out loud with your mouth. I will fervently thank the Lord with my mouth. I will praise him in the presence of many. I'll sing around other people. And and here's why. For he stands at the right hand of the needy.
those who are in need this morning, I want you to know that God is not, he's not distant, waiting for you to say the right words or sing the right way or hit the right notes or pray the right prayer or whatever, and then he comes close. He's at the right hand of anybody who has need today. And that should be a comfort to anyone who has need. And that should be an excuse for all of us to sing and give thanks, whether we're the ones who are in need or not. If we are in need this morning, let us sing and know that Jesus stands at our right hand. And if we're not in need, can we keep in mind who he is and sing on the behalf of the people in the room who are in need? Can we sing with our mouths, not just for ourselves, but for the people who are around us who are in need? Let's sing together for, for the needs we have, for the needs that we know of others, and even for the needs we don't. Let's sing, not because it's what we're supposed to do at the end of church. Let's sing because Jesus is standing at the right hand of anyone who has need. Let's keep worshiping together.
us out of the grave. You take our brokenness. You heal us. You mold us. You shape us. And we can search through everything in this world and find nothing except for you. You are the one that we are searching for.
Oh, I don't know about you. God is so good. You're so loved. I think we covered that today. This is Michelle. We were just hanging out over there, and so I thought it'd be weird to walk out without her, so here we, here we are. Hey, thank you guys for being an amazing church family. Thank you for sharing the resources that God has entrusted to you with your spiritual community, this church. Your giving makes a difference. I feel like we say that every week, which we do, but um, thank you. And I know that you don't do it so that you can hear me say thank you. You do it because it's worship. And um, I, don't, I don't ever want that to get lost on us. So, um, Amen. Amen. Well, I guess I suppose we should do the benediction, should we? You want to stay around and spend time with Jesus in this context. You're certainly welcome. If you want to go home and spend time with Jesus, that's, that's great too. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Love you guys. Have a good week.